Good morning, church. Hey, it is so good to see everybody. Uh, I never get tired of getting to see all of you on Sunday morning. Um, I'm not exaggerating. If you have your Bibles, we are in Genesis chapter 1 again this morning. Genesis chapter 1. Verses 1 through says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And God saw that the light, and there was light. Verse 4, and God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. God, and God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation. Um, the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kinds. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas. And let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Okay, let me catch my breath. And let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for your word. Lord, your word is light and life. And I just pray, Lord, that as we get into it here this morning, that you would speak life into our souls I pray that the name of Jesus Christ would be exalted above every other name. That we would just see 
in your power and in your wisdom, your creative goodness, that we would behold a God who uh, we can't even begin to fathom, who, who gives life and order and beauty and Lord, you sustain everything in this world apart from you. We are nothing. And I just pray, Lord, that we would be reminded of who you are this morning. I pray, Father, that uh, you would just help me to not say anything that would be contrary to your written word or that would hinder the faith of anybody in here. But I pray that just as we reflect on this text this morning, that you would deepen our faith open our eyes uh, to behold the wonders in here. And uh, Lord, we love you. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Well, we started in on Genesis last week, and I told you I was going to hold off on any introductions until at least this week. And so I do want to say a few words of introduction to Genesis. And really the only thing that I think is worth pointing out is that writers later on in the Old Testament, Jesus himself, and then writers in the New Testament, all were in unanimous agreement that the author of Genesis was Moses. It was unquestioned. It was unquestioned even in the early church. It really wasn't even questioned until about 300 years ago. And so, if Moses is the writer of Genesis, and most scholars date him to the 5th century B.C., then what that means for us is that we just read a passage that is over 3,000 years old. It just it kind of just baffles me to think that I'm reading something here that has been in our world and has been world-shaping for literally over 3,000 years. And not only is this super old, but it is absolutely foundational to the Christian faith and the rest of Scripture. Genesis as a whole, Genesis chapter 1, it is foundational. To give you an idea of just how foundational Genesis is, the New Testament alone quotes or references or alludes to the book of Genesis nearly 200 times, which means if you want to understand the Gospels, if you want to understand the ministry of Jesus, Don't start in Matthew chapter 1, start in Genesis chapter 1, because this is where the story begins. This is the story that the Gospels uh, are rooted in and founded upon. And so that's why I'm excited to take some time to look through Genesis and to wrestle with some of these foundational passages. Now, another word to be said about Genesis 1. I feel like we have to talk about the relationship between Genesis and science. I feel like for so many people in our world today, especially younger generations, there is doubt that is cast over Genesis because it doesn't seem to align with our scientific worldview today. And therefore, according to the logic of most, it cannot be trusted. It's mythological. And you see this argument again and again and again. It's like, well, what do we do with this? And it's definitely uh, not that I'm going to try and resolve that today, but I just wanted to give some of my own reflections on the matter. And if they help, then great. And if not, feel free to flush them down the toilet. But I have no doubt that Genesis, including Genesis chapter 1, is absolutely true that it is the inerrant, inspired Word of God. If there's a problem, the problem lies in either our interpretation of Genesis or in the science, or both. But that's a lot different than saying that the problem is in the text itself. We might not interpret it right, but that doesn't mean the text itself is wrong or that's misleading. Now, with that being said, how do people interpret Genesis? 
and I'm probably being unfair to some, but I think it's safe to say that you can boil down most Christians into one of two camps when it comes to interpreting the book of Genesis and these first three chapters in particular. The first camp looks at chapter one and doesn't see it as historical narrative. So they look at it and they say, this is probably meant to be taken as a poem or a song or a liturgy. Others in this camp, they might take it as historical, but they don't necessarily take it as literal. So for example, they'll say, this is true, but the days aren't actually 24-hour days. They'll say, well, look, that day one, there was no sun. The sun isn't created until day three or day four, and therefore these must not be 24-hour days. Uh, Or maybe they Maybe they are, they're just not consecutive days. Or maybe these are just meant to be literary features that move us ahead in a narrative. They're days according to God, but not days in how we think of them. And so for people in this camp, there's really no problem reconciling Genesis with science. It all fits together. There is a second camp, however, that would see Genesis 1 as being historical narrative. And if you're wondering where I'm at personally, which camp I'm in, I have a ton of respect for a lot of people who are in the first camp. And there are people in this first camp who are way smarter than I could ever dream of being. And they have their reasons and uh, like they're trying to be faithful with the text. But with that being said, I find myself in the second camp. And I see Genesis 1 as being historical narrative. And the reason why isn't because I'm trying to compare it with science, but it's because the Old Testament is full of historical narrative, it's full of poetry, it's full of songs. And yet Genesis 1, to me, it doesn't read like a poem. There's a pretty specific structure in Hebrew poetry, and we don't see that structure here. It doesn't read like a song. It reads like historical narrative. And you can say that the days aren't meant to be literal, but again, to me, a straightforward reading, it seems like the author wants us to take these days as 24-hour days. There's evening and there's morning, first day, second day, third day, fourth day. And so that's how I interpret Genesis. And then I can just hear the silent skeptic in the room then saying, but what do you do about this? What do you do about that? How can this be true? How can this be true? And to be honest with you, Like, there's a lot in this passage I don't have answers to. And there's things in this passage it just simply doesn't say, and I'm okay living in that tension. Like, to give you an example, that question about how could there be light before the sun was created, that's a great question. And to be honest with you, I can't say for 100%. I have theories. One of my theories, well, it's not mine, but research, You look at Genesis 1, and it's a bookend to the very end of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22. And guess what? There's a new heavens and a new earth. There's no temple because God himself is a temple. And guess what? The writer says there's no sun, there's no stars, there's no moon. Why? Because God himself is the light. And maybe this verse here is actually just showing us that the the light exists because it comes from God himself. It's supernatural light. I don't know. It's fascinating to me. What do you do with verse 6? Uh, it says, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And then you see in verse 14 that all the stars are in the expanse. And yet water is said to be above the expanse. How do you make sense of this? Right? Well, there are some people who take that uh, literal. And they'll say, and there's multiple arguments, some people actually believe there's water at the end of the universe. Now, before you laugh at them like I did, I actually went on, I was doing research, and it's kind of food for thought, but oh, that's interesting. You know, in 2011, two teams of astronomers they found a body of water in outer space that they estimate to be 12.88 billion light years away and 140 trillion times 
all the water in the world? I, maybe that's what Genesis 1 is getting at. Or I think another reasonable explanation here, the one that I personally buy into, is that when you read some of these verses, it's phenomenological language. The writer is explaining these events in a way that a person would see them, not necessarily in a way that's scientifically true. If you're looking up at the sky, you don't see gaps. It just, it's, it's one thing, and in the sky, there's stars, there's a sun, there's clouds, there's rain coming from the clouds. When Jude and I are driving to church, and I point out to the east, and I say, Judah, look at the sun rising. Am I lying to Judah? Well, no, of course not. Am I being scientifically accurate? No, I'm not, because we know that the sun doesn't rise. The earth orbits around the sun. And I think maybe that's just what's going on here with Genesis. Again, there's some things in here I don't know, and I'm okay with that. But here's some things to keep in mind that may or may not help you to sleep better at night when you read Genesis. For one, this passage speaks into things that science just simply doesn't speak into. One of them is just the origin of life itself. How did life come to be in the first place? I'm not talking evolution. I'm talking before evolution. How did non-matter or non-living material, how did it come to life? Scientists have literally no idea. They thought they had it figured out in 1952 when Stanley Miller was able to take a, an electric current and run it through a glass flask that had hydrogen and ammonia and methane and water in it, and he created amino acids. And we thought, ah, we're getting close to understanding how life came from non-life and 70 years later, and here we are, and we are absolutely clueless. And yet, here's the Bible, and it's like, you want to know where life has come from? In the beginning, God. It's beautiful. Another thing that helps me to sleep better is just knowing that science does develop and it's constantly develop, and we're constantly learning new things. But what that means, though, is that sometimes science actually becomes outdated. You know, today, if you told somebody you didn't believe in the Big Bang, they would probably laugh at you. A hundred years ago, if you told somebody that you did believe in the Big Bang, they would probably laugh at you. You know, Albert Einstein, who is widely regarded as one of the smartest people to ever live, in 1915, when he formulated the theory of relativity, he came to the conclusion that the whole universe is expanding, which then led him to the conclusion that the universe had a beginning. And you know, Albert Einstein was embarrassed about that. He was embarrassed because the whole scientific consensus of that day, just 100 years ago, thought the world was eternal, that it didn't have a beginning. And he was going against the, the entire community. That's just 100 years ago. What if all these things that we assume to be true today, what if in 100 years we look back and realize, actually, there's a lot we thought we knew that we really don't. And there's a lot of areas that, man, we had wrong. All that to say, not that I'm against science. I'm not actually one of my points in here. It's for science. But all that to say, I think, as my wife said, society in general has made science into a god. You ask people, hey, like, do you believe in Jesus? And you know what they say? Especially the younger generations, if you ever ask them, I believe in science. Like, what does that even mean? I, like, okay, yeah, I do too. We need to be careful not to elevate science so high that it becomes the absolute authoritative standard to measure everything else upon truth and error. I think that's a danger here that we're falling into and we're falling prey to. And I just think everybody, no matter where you're at in this conversation, I just think we could all, we would all do well to have a little bit more humility going into these conversations and not being so quick to laugh at others and to deride them from having for having worldviews that, that don't align with ours or 
interpreting scripture differently, regardless of what camp you're in. So with that being said, I want to consider the text and the rest of the time we have this morning. I have four points I just want to think through briefly, and they're just very broad points. Today, I'm not getting into all the nitty-gritty details of verses 3 through 25, so I'm sorry if I disappoint you, but I just wanted to think bigger picture about the text today. And I just wanted us to consider Genesis 1. I want us to see it as a framework for worship, for science, for the rhythms of life, and for salvation. That's just what I want to think about today and wrestle through. So this is what I'm wrestling through. I feel like whenever I give a sermon, it's never like a complete sermon. I'm always just telling you like what I'm wrestling with and what I'm thinking about, and I'm just inviting you to consider with me. That might be a terrible thing to say as a pastor, so you can take that one too or leave it. But in any case, I want to consider Genesis 1 as a framework for worship, for science, for the rhythms of life, and for salvation, for worship. Much of the Old Testament and even the New Testament is centered around the tabernacle which eventually becomes the Jerusalem temple. If you ever read the Old Testament, so much of the, the life of the people is centered around the temple. And if you look at the temple, it's meant to be a place of worship. This is the place where God makes himself known to his people, where he reveals his presence to the people. If you wanted to worship God, if you wanted to pray to God, if you wanted to praise God, if you wanted to offer sacrifice, if you wanted to seek reconciliation with God, you go to the temple. That's where man encounters God, all through the Old Testament. That's where God makes himself known. What's super interesting about Genesis 1 through chapter 3, but we see it in every chapter, and so I'll point it out here, is that there are a striking number of parallels between the creation account and the building of the temple. Just to give just a few, um, for example, in the verses I just read, God speaks seven times. When God tells Moses to build the tabernacle and he gives him instructions between Exodus 25 and Exodus 31, he's going to speak to Moses seven times. You see the Spirit intimately involved in the creation here in Genesis 1, right? Verse 2, the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the waters. But when the people go to build the temple, it's the Spirit that's guiding the people to build the temple. In Exodus 31, we see the Spirit given to two builders in particular who lead the charge in building the temple. In Genesis 3, we see God walking in the garden. In Exodus uh, 29, 45, I think it is, the purpose of the temple is so that God might walk among his people, so that he might dwell among them. Adam, his command is to work the garden and keep it. The garden where God is at in Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 2, Those commands are the same given to the Levitical priests who are supposed to work at the temple, to work and keep the temple. God himself is in the garden. Later on, God himself is going to be in the Holy of Holies in the temple. There's all these parallels. I could go on and on and on with language that is reminiscent between creation and temple and all these parallels. What does all of it suggest? This is what I'm getting at here. What does it indicate to us? it indicates to us that all of creation was meant to be a temple. The whole world was meant to be a place where God dwelt with man. The whole world was for worship of God, so God could dwell among us. That's why he created everything, so we could live in communion with him. And after the fall in Genesis 3, if you read the rest of the story, The grand theme of Scripture is the activity of God in restoring the world to its original purpose. And you go through 
And this story culminates in the life of Jesus Christ, who according to John chapter 2 is the temple of God. And Jesus, through his death and his resurrection, reunites us with God. He builds a new temple by the Spirit of God. We read this in Ephesians chapter 2. It's the church because the Spirit of God dwells in every individual believer. And you get to the end of Revelation, and there it is again, the new heavens and the new earth. There's no temple. Why? Because God himself is the temple, and he's dwelling with his people. The temple language is all through Scripture, and Genesis is a bookend to Revelation, which suggests that Genesis, or uh, creation itself, it's a grand temple where God wants to live with mankind. And here's a couple things that I think this means for us, just practical reflections. It means, first of all, that we were created for worship. Like, that's our purpose in life. It's worship. It's to live in harmony and in union with God, to worship Him, to glorify Him, to enjoy Him forevermore. And so you have most of the world that looks at religion, it looks at worship, and it says that hinders you from living a full life. And yet, no, just the opposite. It's only through worship. It is only uh, in a relationship with God that we can live a full life because you're, you're living in a way that God created you to live. You're living out God's purpose for you, which is worship. To go through life rejecting God and living in sin and darkness and in rebellion is to live a life of complete emptiness and vanity because you're not doing what God created you to do. Genesis 1 reminds us of that. We're created for worship. And here's another implication from that. Missions. Creation here should be a catalyst for missions. And the reason why, if I may steal some of the words of John Piper, because we exist to worship God and there are places in the world where God is not being worshipped. And so we go on mission to bring the glory of Christ to the world so people might come to understand the one true God and worship Him and realize their purpose in life. And we make disciples here at home. And we support missionaries. We embark on this endeavor. Why? Because we love people. And we want to help them do what they're created to do. And we want to glorify God in the meantime. Genesis gives us a framework for worship. It also gives us a framework for science. That probably sounds like I'm running in circles with science. But I think the logic is pretty simple. If God created everything, then everything in this world has the fingerprints of God. Like everything communicates God to us. Listen to Psalm 19. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. And again, listen to what Job says to his friends in Job chapter 12. I just love this. Job says, ask the heavens, or no, he says, ask the beasts, and they will teach you. The birds of the heavens, and they will tell you. Or the bushes of the earth, and they will teach you. And the fish of the sea will declare to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. So what does it mean? Do science. Study the world. Study anatomy. Study geology. Study physics. Study chemistry. Look at the world. Look at all the wonders of it. Listen carefully because everything in this world is pointing us to God. The world, as Tim Keller says, is singing praise to God. And we would do well to just listen to it and use our brains and the resources that God has given us to, to dig 
and the research and be captivated by the glory and the wonder and the power and the wisdom of our creator and sustainer of all. Genesis is a framework for the rhythms of life. Again, just something I'm thinking about for the rhythm of life. I think probably the most familiar part of Genesis 1 to any reader, even if you've never read your Bible, is that God creates the world in seven days. Right? That's the big claim. And we read in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, that that seven-day week becomes the rhythm for the Israelite life. Like their life is structured in a seven-day week. Six days you shall work, the seventh day you shall rest. Do no ordinary work. And here's what's really interesting about the seven-day week. It has no astronomical basis. I've never considered this before, but it's like, whoa, this is weird. The seven-day week has no astronomical basis. The day has an astronomical basis, right? 24 hours for the Earth to rotate on its axis. A month has an astronomical basis, right? The cycles of the moon. A year, the orbit of the Earth around the sun. The seasons, they're marked by the equinoxes and the solstices. But there's no basis for a week. And yet the whole world, at least to my knowledge, follows a seven-day week. And it's been like that for as long as history can tell. And in fact, there have been times where countries have tried to do away with the seven-day week, and they failed. For example, France in uh, the year 1793 to 1805, they got rid of the seven-day week and they incorporated a 10-day week. You work nine days, rest one. Soviet Russia, 1929 to 1940, got rid of the seven-day week, and they tried doing a five-day week, and then a six-day week. And both of those countries reverted back to a seven-day week because they both found that the productivity in the countries dropped dramatically. And in Russia, it caused all sorts like mental health issues and social problems, and it it tore apart the family structure, so they went back to a seven-day week. On a more general note, there's all sorts of research that would suggest that overworking actually lowers your productivity. If you work every day of the week, you're going to be less productive. Your mental health is just going to decline and tank. Everything's gonna just kind of going to spin out of order. People who do that often find themselves depressed, and they've, they're filled with anxiety, and they find life to be meaningless. And yet, on the other hand, Studies suggest that laziness causes all the same problems, that people who are lazy find life to be somewhat meaningless and they get depressed. And what does all this say? I think it just points to the fact that God wired us in such a way that we would live in the rhythm of a seven-day week. It's as if God in his creative order, he created everything in a seven-day week, and yet he has given us that seven-day week that we might live to our full potential, to the life that God has called us to. And if you do away with that week, like if your life becomes imbalance of work and play and laziness, everything gets thrown off. It's like if you want to have a meaningful life, if you want to live the life that God has called us to live, it comes through not playing video games all day like most people think and trying to escape work. It comes through having a job that is meaningful and purposeful, work that is a blessing to the world and a blessing to others, balanced with rest. That's what God intended for us. And we see this all through Scripture starting in Genesis 1. It's like our life is grounded in the creation week. And it's reflective of the creation week. Every week of your life, it's like you're reenacting Genesis chapter 1. It's like your life from week to week is a drama showing God's creative power. And so it's like, live that drama well. 
Genesis 1 is a framework for the rhythms of life. And finally, I want us to consider that Genesis 1 is still a framework for salvation. It's a framework for salvation. God creates everything. There's this pattern here going on, right? You have the separation, and then you have the land being separated from the seas, and then you have the the plants and the birds and the animals and the humans. But before God creates any life, there are these three acts of separation that happen. First, he separates the light from the darkness, and then it's... uh, the waters above from the waters below, and then it's the dry land from the seas. So there's separation. And it just makes sense why there would be separation, because how can anything live if there's only darkness? If there's no land, if there's no light, how can plants and animals and humans live? And so before life can happen, God has to do an act of separation, multiple acts. And I mean, it's, I think, very straightforward, but what's interesting about it is that that becomes a pattern of God's salvation throughout the rest of Scripture. So, like, you look at Israel, for example, and God wanted to bless them and give them new life and lead them to a land flowing with milk and honey, yet His promises were conditional upon them, separating from the pagan ways of the nations around them, separating from their sinful ways. There had to be a work of separation before God would bless them. The whole framework of the New Testament is set in this idea of separation. If you want to have eternal life, if you want to be reconciled to God, there has to be a work of separation before that can happen, before you can truly live. And yet, the hopelessness of the gospel is that we are powerless to do that ourselves. God calls us to separate from the darkness. That darkness is our very own sin, and yet we're unable to do that. Why? Because as we see in Genesis 1, only God can separate the light from the darkness, and He does so by His Word. And yet, the good news of the gospel is that God has given us His Word, His living Word embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's like, if you want to understand the whole ministry of Jesus, he sums it up. In John chapter 12, verse 46, this is what Jesus says. He says, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Jesus came into the world to do a work of separation for us. And he accomplished that work on the cross. The light of the world, it is as if he absorbed our darkness into his body, taking our sins upon himself, suffering in our place so that we can be forgiven. And it is as if when Jesus died, our sins died with him. When he was buried, it's as if our old life was buried with him. Yeah, here's the good news. Just as dry land appeared on the third day in Genesis 1, so the resurrected Jesus appeared three days after the cross. Just as God caused plants and fruit-bearing trees to sprout forth from the earth on the third day, so Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead on the third day, the first fruits of all who believe. And it is in the resurrected Jesus, by faith in him, that God, through Christ, gives us new life. He creates us new. He gives us new birth. And he gives us the power to walk in the light of his truth. And that is how you can live the full life that God desires for you. And Genesis 1 then We'll continue our study of it next week. I didn't want to finish it because I wanted to look more in these last verses. But I hope we can at least see it as a framework for the great salvation that we have in Jesus Christ and for responding to God in worship because he is worthy.
Let me close this with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that you didn't stop your creative work in Genesis chapter 1. We know it carries on. And Lord, you say in your word that if anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. The new has come, the old is gone. It's amazing. We love you so much. I pray, Father, that if anybody doesn't know you, oh, open their eyes to the wonder, the awe, and the goodness of Jesus Christ, and the, the love and the mercy, the grace that you've extended to us through him. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Jesus did all of that so that through him and through the cross, God could recreate us so he can make us new. So we can have a new identity, a new purpose, a new hope, a new life, salvation, so we could be reconciled to God given the Holy Spirit of God who lives in us and dwells in us and brings about righteousness and fruit that leads to life. This is why Paul can say so confidently in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that if anybody's in Christ, he is a new creation. And if you want to understand what that looks like, you want to get a picture of it, go beyond the cross to just three days later. Resurrection Sunday. There where the lifeless Son of God laid in a dark tomb, God began to work a new creation. And he raised him to life. New creation in Jesus. New Genesis 1, starting over upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the hope of the gospel is this. We are invited into that by receiving the word of God in faith. The salvation of God is to create all people new. Starting on the inside and ultimately, we're going to have new bodies, glorified bodies, 1 Corinthians 15, a new heavens and a new earth, a new paradise. This is eternal life. And that is the hope that we have in and through Jesus Christ because of what he did for us in his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. It's the hope of the gospel. With that being said, let me close this with a word of prayer. And this Sunday is the first day of the month. And uh, as always, we we celebrate communion on the first Sunday of every month. And so I figured as we were thinking about Christ, what better time is there then to partake in communion together? And with that being said, as I pray, I'm just going to ask the ushers to come forward. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you can take something that is dead, a world that is formless and void, and you can speak life into it, and it will come to life. It will become beautiful. Chaos will turn into purpose. Lord, apart from you, we are dead. We're dead in our sins. We're lifeless. We're hopeless. We stand condemned but we thank you for your great mercy and your love. We thank you for your power, your goodness, your faithfulness, your unchanging nature. We love you, Lord, and I pray, Father, that our lives would be dedicated to you. And uh, just pray that you'd walk with us and guide us, lead us in every way. We thank you for Jesus Christ in whom we have all hope in the forgiveness of sins. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Feel like we're driven from you, cast out of your presence, hopeless. I pray, Father, that we would throw ourselves upon your mercy and your grace. I pray, Father, that like Jonah, we would call out to you in our distress. We call out to you in our affliction. And Lord, that we would say with Jonah, salvation belongs to the Lord. And I just...
pray, Lord, that you would soften our hearts, that we wouldn't be stubborn and resistant like Jonah, but I pray that we would be your hands and feet in this community, in this area, around the world. Use us however you please. And we pray this in your name. Amen. It's a prediction of what I'm about to do for you. And this same Jesus who spoke this parable would journey on to Jerusalem. And there he would lay down his life on a Roman cross, taking upon himself the sins of Zacchaeus and the sins of the world, all of the pig slop of our life, all of the shame, all of the guilt, all of our unworthiness, and Jesus would suffer for us. You see, church, Zacchaeus was in a tree, and he laid his eyes on his Savior. But a week later, it would be his Savior on a tree looking down at him. The only difference, though, between Jesus and Zacchaeus is that unlike Zacchaeus, who was able to come down from that tree, for Jesus Christ, there would be no coming down. There on that cross, he would suffer and die so that the wrath of, gets, the wrath of God against my sins could be satisfied. There on the cross, Jesus Christ would pay my debt in full and the debt of Zacchaeus and the debt of your sins. See, church, it's like, how do you know that God loves you? Look at the cross. When you look at the cross, you see a God who not only knows you, but he loves you so much that he would suffer for you. And if that's the God that we have, why live in fear? Why live hiding in sin in a foreign land and pig slop? Why not bring your sins and your brokenness and your shame and, and lay it at his feet? Why not come to him in faith and call upon his name and throw yourselves upon the mercy of God? This is what God is inviting us to do. This is the Jesus who we read about in the story of Zacchaeus. A God who not only knows us, but a God who loves us deeply. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. In him, indeed, I trust. Let me close this with a word of prayer. And as I do, I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward, and uh, we're going to celebrate communion together. This is the first Sunday of the month. And the only thing that I would say about communion is just let the bread and the cup, which symbolizes the body and the blood of Christ, let it be a reminder to you and assure you of God's love for you. Let me pray for us. Dear Lord, thank you that you are gracious even to sinners like us. Unworthy and wretched we are. Lord, we know you love sinners because look at your love for Zacchaeus. I pray, Father, that we want to hide. I pray, Father, that we want to be content in our own self-righteousness, but that, that our trust would be in you and you alone, the God who saves. And I just pray this in your name. Amen. Abuse uh, uh, addictions, to come out of their addictions, and give them basic education. Now, these kids are not school dropouts. They have never been to school. So a 12-year-old and a 5-year-old together in a room learning ABCDs. Now what we do after that, what we do, we keep them for two years, and after that we help them to get admission in the public school with some paperwork that they don't have because most of them are illegal, illegal immigrants from Bangladesh. They don't say it, uh, but we know it. <laughs> so we help them with the papers and help them to get in the public school. Now in school, we cannot share Christ with them. So what we started to do, call them for VBSs on summers and share Christ with them. Now, 
I kept hearing this from all the kids, ma'am, please bring us back to the center. We were so much loved here, taken care. Now in the, in the public school, we are not taken care well. So we started to pray a big prayer. We said, Lord, give us a, a big school, a proper school, K to 12, where I can get these kids for a longer period of time in my school and see life changes. Mm, little less I knew that what I'm getting into. <laughs> But I was, I'm so thankful to God that God brought that vision come through. Can I have a next slide, please? And now we have a school. And this school is half done. That building is still coming. Once that is done, we will be having uh, more classes that we need for kids. Today, till date, we have 225 kids in this school. Now, this school has started with threefold uh, purpose. The first is, this is like we wanted to have for higher class, high end, uh, English medium, very good school, high class, high caste, lower caste, low class, all kinds of caste and creed kids can come in our school. That's sometimes very difficult. So what we have, the first, uh, the first thing that the value of our school, the purpose of our school is to see that three high class kids paying fees, will their fees will cover the fourth child that is an underprivileged child. So 25% of our school kids are from the slums and from the Sansoi people group that you are teaching. Because right across the road of our school is the whole Sansoi people, people group that's staying there. So that's the first thing. Second thing, this building can be used for all Christian activities that we cannot do on the, <laughs> uh, generally that we cannot do in the hotels. So we can speak freely about Christ, we can share all our strategy, Deepak just shared this in the Sunday school. Once we were having our annual conference, and there we had all these maps posted everywhere of the states. And on that maps, there were like green and yellow dots, means where there is church, where there is no church. Suddenly, one afternoon, we saw somebody coming and clicking pictures. And we, mostly we have name tags, but somehow that guy didn't have. Some suspicion came. Somebody asked, who are you? And he said, I'm from the Intelligence Bureau. Ooh, <laughs> so that's a scary situation. And with the government right now, um, I shouldn't be saying this much, but it's very sensitive for us. So the second purpose of this school, that this school will be used for all the, when it is off, it will be used for all Christian activities that we can do with the secure boundaries. And the third thing, the benefit of this school, the profit of this school will go towards the local uh, ministry in that, uh, of that particular state. So we are very excited for this school. Yes, it is stressful if you ask me, sometimes very stressful, <laughs> but it's a joyful thing to see how this is going to work in the years and generations to come, how this school is going to be the light and salt for the area. So we are very excited for this thing also. Yeah, we also helped during the COVID and it was like, uh, First time COVID when it hit, it was horrible. Not because of the COVID, but because of the government regulations. We had total shutdown. It was like a curfew situation. Eight o'clock, Prime Minister comes on the stage and says that by 10, wherever you are, stay there. Don't move. So it was very good that COVID can be restricted in certain places, and he said within 14 or 21 days, we will be over with this. We can identify and then we can treat and it can be over. But what happened, it got extended, extended and extended. So like migrant laborers who come from the other states, they had no food to eat, nothing to do. So now they said what? Either we have to die of hunger or we are going to. Yeah, so they started walking back. Thousands of people started walking back. Uh, walking back means more than uh, 300, 400 miles. They said we will walk, but we will at least reach our home. One time, one place, they were so tired that they slept on the railway track. And they did not know the train comes on this track. And railway uh, rail came, the train came, and seven or eight of them were their head and they were di they died to that uh, so 
we were able to go out, praise the Lord, because government asked all the NGOs and especially those who have foreign funding to help in this situation. So they gave us the passes to go out. And those days we distributed food packages. Uh, like those who are traveling, we provided the food packages. And those who were staying uh, in their own places, we, st uh, we gave them 15 days of dry groceries. One of the places our people had gone, and that place was like uh, from Himachal Pradesh. It captured the in social media also. Uh, not social media, mm, the local. local media, that this is the first team going to that village. Means from their place, it's a hill area, and there's very little road, and they went with the help there. And second time, when COVID hit, they went with other things like medicine, and uh, we had medicines, we had the gloves, oximeters, uh, oxygen concentrator, and we have masks. Uh, so these things we gave it to them. Oxy oxygen concentrator we gave it to hospital because there was no oxygen. Next, like last year, people were dying because of lack of oxygen. Anuja's sister died in that, my brother-in-law died, and a few of the people that we were able to save from our family and friends, but some of them died. Uh, very good pastors also died in that. So it was horrible, and but uh, God, praise God that God helped us. And this was our first team went there because two trained leaders we had in that place, they invited us there, and 10 volunteers went there. And today we have eight churches, eight fellowship in that area because people recognized when nobody was coming, these people have come there. So we thank God the way that God is working, and uh, it's uh, awesome. Please pray, continue to pray. India is towards declaring as a Hindu country. When they say Hindu country, that means only Hindus or only people who born in India and those who follow Indian religion, they can be the citizens. Others can be like second grade citizens. Second grade citizen means like you have green card here. People can come and do the business and things. So you can do that, live happily, but you have no role in making decisions. And at present government also, there are 14% Muslims and 3% Christians, but there is no representation of Chris Christians or Muslims in the present government. So they are very open to say that this is a Hindu country and they are moving towards that. Uh, so government is passing many laws which are horrible, like they are saying 10 years imprisonment, even if somebody says that this person was trying to convert me. So that uh, thing is, uh, that is, uh, Many people are getting into, going into the jail. 10 or 15 of our trained people have also experienced that. Uh, so pray, please pray that uh, God, God is almighty and uh, nothing happened without, everything is in his control. In his right time, he brings the peace and he brings uh, people back to him. But local people have no problem they have their problems, they need their solutions, and they are finding Jesus is the solution for them. So continue to pray for that. I think this clock is not working, isn't it? So it is not my fault, it is that clock fault. <laughs> if I have taken more time. Thank you again for standing with us. One of the things that we did as a church back in 2018 and 2019, I believe, is we partnered with Life Counts Now as a church, and we raised $25,200. Um, we did this in various ways, through givings, offerings, uh, selling eggs and pies and bean bags and garage sales and all this and that. And essentially what we did was... Um, 
we raised that money so that two missionaries could be sent into an area of India called Sansoy, which from uh, uh, statist- statistically speaking had zero evidence of Christianity at the time that we adopted this people group. So there's no evidence of any Christians living in this area, no pastor, no Bible, no nothing Christian related. And uh, Life Counts now sent in two missionaries to this area who've been working diligently since we sent them. And I have the report here, uh, which is very current. From July of 2020 until June of 2022, those missionaries uh, shared the gospel with 5,427 people. Out of those, 491 of them received Jesus Christ as their Savior. 23 house churches have been started, and 454 of those people are attending those house churches, even now as we speak. And so it's just like, you know, we give glory to the God who can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. And uh, we're grateful for people like you guys who are there at the front lines and um, doing what you're doing. So let me close this with a word of prayer, and uh, I'll ask the worship team to come forward as they do. Our gracious Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. And so I pray that you would raise up laborers who would go into the fields and take part in this commission, Lord. I pray that our church wouldn't lose sight of uh, what you've called us to, that we wouldn't lose sight of the Great Commission. And I just pray that our heart would beat for the same thing that your heart beats for, Lord. Um, I just thank you so much for Deepak and Nisha and Life Counts Now and just everything that they're doing over on the other side of the world. I, I pray that you would bless them in every way, that you would sustain them, Lord, uh, spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially, Father. I uh, just pray that you would prosper their efforts, their ministry, um, that more and more people would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and uh, that you just give them the joy of being part of that and seeing that and um, helping make that happen. And we just thank you for this time together. We thank you that we could have them here this Sunday. And um, Father, you're so good. We love you so much, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.